Okay, we move to the next topic. The right to security of tenure. Security of tenure prohibits an employer from dismissing an employee without just cause or without authorized cause. Stated otherwise, an employer can validly dismiss an employee only for just cause or for authorized cause. Now, what is the difference between a just cause and authorized cause? Well, first, in a dismissal for just cause, the employment is terminated because the employee is at fault. But in dismissal for authorized cause, the employment is terminated mainly because of economic reasons and not because of a fault or infraction on the part of the employee. Second distinction, dismissal for just cause obliges the employer to give the employee opportunity to explain before imposing the penalty of dismissal. Whereas in dismissal for authorized cause, it merely requires a written notice of termination served one month in advance to the employee and to the Department of Labor. Another distinction is dismissal for just cause does not entitle an employee to any relief, whereas the dismissal for authorized cause entitles the employee to separation pay. If an employee is illegally dismissed, what would be his remedy? Well, the remedy is a complaint for illegal dismissal filed with the arbitration branch of the NLRC. Injunction is not the proper remedy because injunction is not a cause of action but merely a provisional remedy. This is illustrated by the case of PAL versus NLRC. Now, in this case, PAL dismissed two flight attendants because of currency smuggling. Now, instead of filing a complaint for illegal dismissal, they filed a petition for injunction with the NLRC, praying that uh, PAL be enjoined from dismissing them and to reinstate them to their former position with back wages. The NLRC issued an injunction, thereby enjoining PAL from dismissing the flight attendants. The Supreme Court ruled that the NLRC is not correct because the power of the NLRC to issue an injunctive writ originates from a labor dispute. And in this case, there is no labor dispute between the parties because there has yet been no complaint for illegal dismissal filed with the labor arbiter. And there being no complaint for illegal dismissal, the NLRC cannot validly entertain the action for injunction. As regards the reliefs for illegal dismissal, that determine who the employee is. Is he an overseas Filipino worker or is he a locally employed worker? Now, for overseas Filipino workers, the relief is reimbursement of placement fee with 12% interest per annum, plus basic salaries for the unexpired portion of the employment contract. In some cases, moral damages, exemplary damages, and attorney's fees may be awarded if warranted. Now, for local employees, the relief is reinstatement without loss of seniority rights and privileges plus back wages, and in some cases, moral damages, exemplary damages, and attorney's fees may be awarded if warranted. The prescriptive period for an action for illegal dismissal. What is the prescriptive period for an action for illegal dismissal? Well, to answer that, look at the prayer in the complaint. If the complaint uh, prays for reinstatement, the prescriptive period is four years because the suit is predicated upon an injury to the rights of the plaintiff. So here we apply the civil code. But if the complaint prays only for separation pay, the action is a money claim which prescribes in three years, pursuant to Article 306 of the Labor Code. Prescriptive period is reckoned from the date of dismissal and not from the date when the employee was acquitted in the criminal case. What I have told you earlier is the prescriptive period for an action for illegal dismissal. Action for illegal dismissal. Now, if the question is, what is the prescriptive period for an action for reinstatement? The answer is four years. Dito ang tanong, action for reinstatement. Yung kanina, action for illegal dismissal. Ito, action for reinstatement prescribes in four years. That is why, sabi ko sa inyo kanina, determine the prayer and the complaint. If the complaint prays for reinstatement, four years yan. Four years ang prescriptive period. Suppose the employee was able to obtain employment elsewhere. What? is the effect of that on the right to reinstatement. Well, the right to reinstatement of employees adjudged to have been illegally dismissed subsists 
even though they have obtained employment elsewhere during the pendency of the complaint for illegal dismissal. The option on whether to return to their employment or not is for the employee to decide. Now, regarding earnings elsewhere, they cannot be deducted from the back wages. So if the employee who was illegally dismissed was able to get another job after his dismissal, his earnings from his new job cannot be deducted from the back wages that may be awarded to him. Regarding moral and exemplary damages, it is not enough for you to prove that the dismissal was illegal. You have to prove that the dismissal was done in bad faith or is contrary to morals, good custom, or public policy, or that it resulted in wounded feelings, grave anxiety, and a similar injury. Because here, we are no longer applying the labor code. We are applying here the civil code, the provisions of the civil code on moral damages. Now, regarding exemplary damages, the employee should further prove that the dismissal was done in a wanton, oppressive, or malevolent manner. Now, can corporate officers be held personally or solidarily liable with the corporation for, say, back wages, damages, or other monetary claim? Well, as a rule, corporate officers cannot be held personally or solidarily liable, even if they were impeded in the complaint. But if the corporate officer acted in bad faith, or if the corporation is no longer existing and the employees can no longer run after the company to satisfy the judgment in their favor, then the corporate officers or directors can be held personally or solidarily liable. So sometimes during the pendency of the case, the employee dies. Now what is the effect of death during the pendency of the illegal dismissal case? If the death occurred prior to the filing of the position paper, the complaint will be dismissed because the action does not survive, because the cause of action does not involve property rights but injury to the complaining employee. But it may be true that the right of a person to his labor is deemed property within the meaning of constitutional guarantees, but the injury complained of is to the person and not to the property or rights to property, which is merely incidental. On the other hand, if death occurred after the filing of the position paper, then the deceased may be substituted by the heirs.